and right. um, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Everyone welcome, um, Danielle. So today I'm going to be talking about the use of rich pictures in evaluation. Firstly, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how rich pictures sort of work and where they come from in the soft systems methodology. Then I'll give you some tips for running a session and a few ideas about how you might analyse the information that comes out of the pictures. So, why, why, why might we use rich pictures? This <coughs> session is for evaluation practitioners looking for a tool to help visualise some of those problematic situations you see at the beginning of an evaluation that you want to unpack to aid in the development of an evaluation framework. Over the next quarter of an hour, I'll discuss how rich pictures can be a useful tool when you seek to isolate key issues quickly, when you will want to avoid being overwhelmed in complex situations, when you need to take into account emerging or changing circumstances, when you want to ensure all key stakeholders are represented and their perspectives heard, when you need to understand interconnections that might not be initially apparent, and when you need to understand problematical situations fast. Now what we found is that rich pictures can help you get on track first. I found them to be a very time efficient way of generating a lot of understanding about a situation, particularly when you have the right people involved in developing them. And as an aside, I'd say that often if you're struggling with the rich picture, it may actually be because the people involved don't have enough knowledge. So there can be a bit of a check in that way as well. Um, they're a very useful way to start collecting information at the beginning of the project when, as an external evaluator, you may not have a deep knowledge about that particular project, as it's possible to facilitate them even when you don't have that knowledge. Our rich pictures are a really good way of showing complicated situations. They attempt to capture a real situation using a no-holds-barred cartoon representation of all the connections, relationships, influences, and ideas and cause and effect. Now, rich pictures are also a way for us to connectively learn not, about, not only about the obvious facts of a situation, but also about the abstract or emotional things like the social atmosphere among the different actors and stakeholders. Now, we've found that integrating the use of rich pictures into our evaluation practice is helpful when we're setting the scope for an evaluation, when we're framing the key evaluation questions, or informing the development of the evaluative criteria. And we have written a little bit more on these things, not so much using rich pictures in this area, but how we do this more in general. And there's a reference at the back of this um, slide set for you on this. So we tend to use rich pictures at the start of an evaluation to help us better understand the territory. Now, what seem to be the barriers to using rich pictures? If rich pictures are so uh, are hard to do well, then why might we bother with them? Well, the rich pictures come from soft systems methodology, and this methodology has existed for over 40 years. Um, a colleague, Bob Williams, has consistently said that rich pictures offer considerable value to evaluators, and indeed, the soft systems methodology does. However, it's still relatively unknown to us as evaluators. Um, so one of the things I'd say about the soft systems methodology is that it contains a number of useful tools. And what's not commonly known is that you don't need to use the whole soft systems methodology. You can just cherry pick the parts you want. And the literature confirms that many people are doing just this, just using some of the tools from the methodology. So in this presentation, I'm suggesting just using the rich pictures tool from the soft systems methodology and using the rich pictures at the start of an evaluation to help get a sense of the scope, identify the key evaluation questions, and feed into the development of the evaluation framework. Okay, but rich pictures still have a reputation for being hard to do well. Is this justified? Possibly. In this next section, we'll look at some aspects of setup and analysis that are important and will help you to use rich pictures well. So what are the pragmatics of organising a group to do a rich picture? As in any qualitative group, you need to consider the group dynamics. And as we all know, when you're working with groups, they need to go through those stages of forming, norming and storming. People are more likely, I've found, to be able to do a rich picture once the group is formed. 
that means this is not a good starting exercise. And I generally do some other kind of warm-up exercise first if I have to do them fairly early on in the session. Or ideally, I would actually wait till about halfway through a workshop to do the rich picture and leave it as one of the exercises we do later on when people have formed as a group. Now, when drawing rich pictures, I'd suggest you generally uh, want about three to six people working on each drawing. Uh, once you get beyond about six people, they tend to split into two groups anyway, and so it's better to just plan for that. Um, also, at times, it's important to think who's in each group drawing the pictures. And if you have a, a group uh, with senior managers and support staff and a, a range of operational staff, you will want to mix them up at the table so that you get those different perspectives um, within each group drawing the pictures. Another thing you need to consider is how confidentiality will be managed. Some of the representations that people draw are going to be the unmentionables. The elephants in the room, um, the, the holy cows, however you describe them in your culture, the things that uh, people don't normally talk about. And often we know that people have started to draw these when you hear a loud laugh at a table. And then you find that that's what's happened. Someone's drawn one of these pictures. And often at that point, other people all pick up pens and start contributing to the drawing as well. So it can be quite a nice process of actually getting a whole lot more people engaged in the drawing side of the picture. So one of the things, because we know we're going to have those unmentionables come up, is we need to um, consider at the start of the process how we're going to manage confidentiality. One of the ways that we often do this is we just stay, what's, what's said in the room stays in the room, and we ask people to use what we call Chatham House rules, which are very much an English convention. You probably have a different way of describing this in the States. We also need to consider the power dynamics. And one of the things we've found is that sometimes people like to get us in to draw these, get these pictures drawn rather than doing them from inside the organisation, particularly as they know that some of these issues that are going to come up may be sort of things that the, person, the evaluator may not want to address. So it's handy to have someone like us actually running that part of the session. Okay, so explaining what's required in a rich picture can be a bit tricky at the start. How might you introduce the idea of a rich picture? And how might you get people to know how to do one? Um, luckily for us all, the UK Open University has a great page with instructions on how to do rich pictures and how to introduce them to participants. And you'll see on the um, chart that you've got in front of you that there's a, a link at the bottom of the page. And if you click on that, it will take you to all that Open University material. I tend to follow their approach. Um, but not everybody does, and if you have a look in um, Bob's latest book, he's got a different way of um, setting up a rich picture and running it. So there are different ways of doing these. The way that I'm suggesting here is just one way, and I appreciate that lots of people have different approaches to doing them. The key thing is that um, respondents are clear what the um, task is going to be. And so I kind of break this down into two stages. First, we need to introduce the idea of rich picturing and that we want them to do a rich picture. And then we tell them about the, um, the question we want them to answer. Now, I actually use this little drawing that you can see here where you've got people going, oh, I don't know where to start. Oh, no, anything but rich pictures. How can I draw this? Because these are the kind of um, responses that you get from people as they're drawing them. And injecting a little bit of paper is quite a good way to start. Once we get into the picture, once we get to the drawing, one of the key um, challenges of doing rich pictures well, in my view, is actually getting a good question. And I think it's worth testing the question before you run the session to make sure that there aren't any ambiguities in it or any unintended um, consequences of it. And of course, that's the same as any question. Um, so there are two parts to the question, I guess, in that it both needs to be general enough to capture structure, processes, issues and concerns, and the participants' roles and relationships, and yet also specific enough to understand the problem being addressed. In a lot of the, soft, in this, lot of the systems thinking world, people talk about not mapping the whole system, but just mapping the area that, area that is considered problematic. And this is what Checkland talks about as well. He says, we don't need to drink the ocean. Let's just focus on the part that's the area we need to be in. Okay, so you've given the instructions. What happens next? Well, often, nothing. 
And, and this can be the really scary part in doing a rich picture is that there's this enormous pause after you've explained what needs to happen as people think about what they're going to do. And I have to admit, the first time I did a rich picture, when this happened, I thought, oh my goodness, have I actually got my question right? What's happening here? Um, but people do just need that time to start to think about how they're going to um, approach the task. Um, and so what we find is that um, we just need to allow that sort of 15 seconds or so. It will feel like the longest 15 seconds in your life, possibly. As I've already mentioned, um, some people may not be sure how to start, and the experience of drawing a rich picture can feel quite uncertain for some, and particularly senior managers might be a little bit anxious about their performance in this kind of space. So sometimes I just encourage um, participants to suspend judgment and trust in the process, um, and to stay the <coughs> lock. Give me 15 minutes, just, I promise you this is going to work. Just, just give us a bit of time for it to get started. And, and normally if we do that, we're fine. The good news is it doesn't matter where people start on their picture, the key thing is for them just to get started. Some people won't want to pick up a pen, others will love being the scribe. And often I find in rich picturing, for the first sort of five or ten minutes, mainly one person draws, and then often after the unmentionable comes up, other people start to join in. And you may find by the end of the session most people are drawing, but there may be one or two that really hold back from that. And I've learned that's okay, and I just go with that. Now along the way, it's great to mitigate feelings of uncertainty and provide um, reassurance that the, that the process is working fine and that the drawings that they're doing are on track. <coughs> now one thing I can't stress strongly enough is that the drawing is the medium. And in this context, it's used as a way to enable people to express their ideas, insights and feelings. It's important to reassure people we're not after a masterpiece, we just want their ideas on paper. And so I often have little drawings on my slides, like the one you can see here that's something I drew, to make it clear that a messy drawing is fine and that, we, that all attempts are good and stick figures and quick ways of conveying ideas are particularly what we're after. Now, as people are drawing the pictures, there may be some moments of uncertainty or frustration for some who want perfect pictures or who struggle with just drawing stick figures. These may be people that are normally very articulate and they find this process is kind of slowing down their communication, as it were. I mean, it's not, but that's how they feel. Participants have told us that it's a bit like going whitewater rafting. You're not sure where you're going or if you can manage what's around the next corner. So it's important to reassure them that feelings are normal during the process and that the process will be worth their while. Now, as people get more drawings on the page, they can start to feel a bit overwhelmed. I've had people say, oh my goodness, I knew this was complex, but now I see it on the page, it just makes me feel tired or it just gives me a headache. Um, again, reassure them this is a normal way to feel during this part of the process. And you know, we often find people feel that way at that stage. Okay, so you've managed to get your group to draw a rich picture. They've been working on it for about 40 to 50 minutes. What's next? How are we going to analyze the data that we've collected? Okay, here's an example of a rich picture. As you can see, without explanation, it's actually fairly unintelligible. But those who constructed it could tell you a compelling story about why they went to the conference, the activities they selected, and a whole lot of other stuff about this conference. So, how are we going to interpret the information in the pictures? As one of my colleagues has said, this is where the magic happens. In our practice, we get participants to tell the story of their pictures once they are completed. And I generally allow five to eight minutes per picture for these descriptions. This is where the real richness of the method becomes apparent, as people describe their views of the problematic situation to others in the room. So there's also a sharing of understanding as, a, to a, as, as others um, explore their thoughts and insights and, and what's happened. And so we ran a session last week where we had 24 people in the room and we had them drawing four rich pictures. And they all had different things in their pictures. <coughs> Got them all together they could really see the benefit of what they'd done and we've got a really rich resource now how do we capture this well we don't guess what people's pictures mean we don't read anything into their drawings 
We audio tape the descriptions, and so we'll get them to stand up, one person in the group to stand up, describe the picture. Two others will hold the picture up, and so they can be pointing to aspects of the picture, so we're really clear which bits of the picture they're talking to, and then we audio tape that description. Uh, we then have that transcribed, and we use that as data for our, our evaluation. And we tend to look for themes, be they the boundaries, perspectives, or interrelationships that might inform how we proceed from here. Now, one of the questions I had last year when I presented um, a brief um, demonstration workshop on this at AEA was how do people, how do we show the drawings in our reporting? And actually, to date, we haven't used the drawings in our reporting. For a start, we probably have to redraw them because they've got all these unmentionables in them. And as you saw from this picture here, um, they're pretty unintelligible, really, in their raw state. And, and then, they're, as we said, they're actually a medium. They're not meant to be the message itself. They're the way we're capturing information. So we're looking um, for these abstract and emotional bits of feedback that we might get, um, like the social atmosphere amongst the different actors and stakeholders. Where we just brought uh, in for a minute to people, uh, start getting your questions in, if you would, because we're going to finish up in about nine minutes and we want to make sure we have all the questions to answer that people want to ask. Okay, Judy, keep going. Okay, so it's time to wrap up now. You're right, Johnny. I've given you a whistle-stop tour of how you might use rich pictures at the start of an evaluation. I've shown you that the territory is a bit challenging, but that rich pictures can be a valuable tool in your toolkit if you persevere and accommodate the uncertainty. I've given you some hints for how to do rich pictures well, traps to watch out for, and ideas on how you might analyse your rich picture. I hope you'll give rich pictures a try. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Johnny. Thank you very much, Judy. We have a couple of questions in, so bear with me. I have a bit of a sore throat, but hopefully people can hear me. Uh, the first question is, can you explain the difference between a rich picture and a non-rich picture? In other words, <laughs> what, what is a rich picture in this context? A rich picture to me is a picture that's describing a problematical situation. And so you've got a group of people working on it, um, and it's, it's one where they're, they're telling you about what's happening in the system. So if we think back, we were talking about, in that little picture that we had of the rich picture, um, we were talking about structure, processes, issues and concerns, and including yourself. So the rich picture is, I mean, they look very rough, but these are the components that they capture. Got it, okay. So the next question we have, David is asking, how long do you let people go through this exercise? How long do you actually let them take pencil to paper and draw? So typically I'd allow between 30 and 40 minutes. It depends on the complexity of the situation. The one we were doing last week, we thought we'd allow them 45 minutes, but in fact we ended up allowing 55 minutes because we could see that they weren't finished. So we had another activity at the end that was optional that we could pull out if we needed to, and that's what we did. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question. Have you ever used rich pictures in a pre-post design where people can do their pictures and then you do an intervention or whatever and then you can look at the rich pictures again and see what the differences are? No, I haven't done that, but I've done something that was fascinating, which was where we um, got people who were the <coughs> policy implementers, the people that developed the policy and the people that implemented the policy to come together and draw a rich picture together of, of what happened. And that was really useful, actually. That was one of the most useful ones I think we've ever done. So that's a great idea, doing a pre and post. I really like that. Thank you for that. Great. Um, can you say something about the instructions that you give people? Right. Can you sit um, down and what do you tell them when you get this thing started? I think that I'd, to do that would actually take quite a lot of time, so I'd refer you to the website, um, have a look there, and this is something that I might do a little another session on at some <coughs> point in a bit more detail. Um, it, it would actually take me longer than I could do here right now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what do you tell people about uh, the boundaries of a rich picture? I mean, presumably there are things that you want in and out. Well, if you framed your question right, that will come out okay. And that's the point, is getting that question right so that those boundaries are there. Um, and, and 
I mean, in fact, we don't care where they put the boundaries, we're, we're interested in where they see the boundaries being around a problem. Because sometimes things are happening because of something you may not know of, and that's going to be one of the magics of the picture. So we okay. don't put boundaries around them like that. All right. Uh, now, this is an interesting question, mostly because it involves something I've never heard of before. Uh, the question is how rich pictures compare with anecdote circles. I, mean, I don't know what anecdote circles are. <laughs> make up an answer for us. I can't. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, can you give an example of the kinds of instructions or prompts that you give people to get them started? Okay. So, well, I normally just actually stand back and give them space. And one of the things I've found in those first sort of two or three minutes when they're really struggling, it's best to just keep out of it actually and let them almost sort of self-settle and write themselves a bit because it, it, it is, can be a little bit tricky for them getting into the space. Um, sometimes if they say, you know, we don't know whether to draw this or whether to draw that, I'll say, well, what do you think? What would you put at the center of this? Or I might say, it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the picture, this is all gonna work out anyway, just get started. So I tend to just be reinforcing them on, on whatever they're um, doing and just just encourage them at that point because it will kind of sort itself out later on you might give them a prompt if there's something that they haven't raised in their picture that other people seem to have in their pictures but at the same time what we're really wanting to do here is get their perspective so it's kind of like interviewing in a way you've got to be a bit careful not to prompt too much um, but just to keep them on track okay fair enough let's see we have an endorsement here um about having used this with uh, uh, youth who are involved in the bullying program, and she loves it and would do it again, as they say. Um, is it possible to use any kind of electronic media? I mean, instead of markers and crayons and pen and pencil, uh, have you ever tried using smart boards or anything along those lines? I haven't tried that yet. Um, I, when we did the ones in, um, at AEA last year, we used crayons. And afterwards, Bob said to me, for goodness sake, get marker pens. They're much better. And I agree. I tend to use um, big, fat marker pens, but I also give people a wide range of colored pens so that they can choose what they like. And okay. often if I've got someone who's not participating but clearly needs to be, um, I'll do something silly like give them a pink pen or um, you know something like that just to kind of jolly them along a bit and often they'll reject the pink pen but they might pick up another one. <laughs> uh, have you ever used the rich pictures with individuals rather than with groups? Like no, I haven't. I haven't yet. Um, and that's a really interesting idea. That was one I talked with Bob about. And he says that sometimes he'll draw a rich picture himself to try yeah. and unpack a situation. So I haven't tried that yet. Um, but, you know, that could be interesting. Okay. Uh, now, here's a question. Uh, can you give, talk a little bit about <clears throat> sort of carrying the rich picture through the evaluation? I mean, you do it up front but presumably it's generated some knowledge or information that's used as the evaluation goes on, or not. Yeah, no, we do tend to use them as it goes on because it is unpacking the problematic situation for people. So we did some um, rich pictures uh, last year when we were doing a, an evaluation for one of our clients, and it really unpacked what a lot of the issues were and gave us a much deeper understanding than we would have had in an hour and a half otherwise. The other reason we've started using them is they're such a quick way to get out a lot of information. And I don't know about you, but we're finding that we can never get more than about two hours max these days with senior management teams. Right. Okay. So it's finding something really quick. And that's kind of what's, what actually drove me to really work with them and grip them up. Okay, excellent. Well, we have a couple of minutes left. So are there, is there any, any parting words of wisdom for the assembled multitudes here? Um, I, I read quite a bit at the start of using rich pictures about how you might analyze the, um, the actual drawings themselves. And I have given you some resources at the end. I'll just put these up now so people can see them. Um, I've put some resources at the end that talk about how people use them, um, sort of use, uh, ideas about the icons and what you might, and how you might read into them. But I've tended personally not to do that myself. I've, I've tended, to, I come out of a market research background where we used um, sort of enabling techniques for branding and marketing and, and saw the power in letting people just express how they see things. Um, and then also learned very early on in an example 
um, where a young boy had, had put together a, a drawing for me and I thought it meant one thing and it actually meant something completely different to him, that it's so important that we actually ask people to unpack their pictures for us. As I said, um, one of my colleagues, um, when he first came to um, one of the rich picturing sessions, he said afterwards, wow, I, I didn't know this was going to work so well. He said the magic really happened when you got those people to explain their pictures to each other. There was such a transferring of knowledge and um, and we got so much out of it as well. So that's the part of the um, process I guess I'd recommend that you don't skimp on, allow plenty of time for that in your first few, first few working through of this. Okay, well it's 12.30 and we did promise to finish up by 12.30, or oh, I guess if people want to stay on longer that would be great. Uh, let me put in a plug, we are always looking for speakers, so if you want to be a presenter or you know people who might want to be presenters and you have subjects and topics that you think we ought to cover, as I like to say, you know where we are, send us an email, give us a call. Uh, I can't promise we'll accommodate you, but we'll certainly try and we are looking. Uh, that having been said, we do have, we are finished. Although, Judy, if you want to stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has any questions, hope all we have are kudos. Thanks, Judy. Excellent presentation. I would certainly, certainly agree with that. Ah, someone else is very helpful. Well, you got quite a fan club here. <laughs> well, listen, thank you to everybody for uh, tuning in here. Ah, were you able to get copies? Yes, the entire presentation, the slides and the audio uh, will be on the uh, website, on the webinar website. Uh, and that will be true for all the speakers, by the way. You can see us on YouTube, and you can get copies of our slides. And so I don't know when uh, Danielle will put that link up, but I guess pretty soon, right, Danielle? Yep, we usually do it right away. Good. <laughs> we already have Judy's slides. Outstanding. All right, listen, as I said, thank you to everybody. We're glad you got something out of this. Uh, we are looking for topics. We are looking for speakers. Don't be shy. Give us recommendations. So thank you all again. And Judy, you can you know, have to sleep or get up early, I suppose, for all those people in, in very different time zones. Okay. Oh, well, if that's, um, if that's all the questions, um, I'll sign off. Fantastic. Listen, have a wonderful rest of the day or evening to everybody, if the case may be. Okay.